and um, I'm, I'm speaking at women's convention. And so, yeah, thank you guys. Um, but I didn't want to share my message for women's convention. Uh, so God gave me another relentless word for you <laughs> tonight. Um, because I kept thinking about what it meant to be relentless, and God put this on my heart. Um, okay, so 1 Corinthians 2 is there. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. And when you get there, just give me a loud shout so I know you're there. I feel a spirit of victory in this place tonight. I want to thank God for my husband. And um, he's so cute because he hates how I type out my notes. He just, it just bugs him. Because <laughs> he's very orderly and he's very, you know, he does his notes so perfect. And so he actually grabbed the computer from me today and retyped out all my notes. <laughs> and I just thank God for a husband like that that is just so supportive and so loving and and, um, you know, just supportive in everything that God has me to do and realizes that God has placed a calling and purpose upon my life. And I just thank God for him. And I, I thank God for my church. I thank God for our region, our multi-region, my partners in ministry. And I thank God for you, every single one of you, our church. And so 1 Corinthians 15, 58, let's begin reading. And to me, this was a relentless verse, okay? <laughs> Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. I want you to say that with me. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Say that with me. Let nothing move you. Tell your neighbor, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Does it say always give yourself a little bit to the work of the Lord? Kind of when you feel like it, on a good day, when you have no problems. No, it says always, always give yourselves fully, fully. To me, that means give your best. Give every part of yourself. Give your best. Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Lord God, we come before you, and we just thank you for this night. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives tonight, and I pray you anoint this, wor this word that you have given me and that you put me aside. You speak through me. You're anointing upon me. And I pray that every woman in this place, your word penetrates their hearts. And I pray you challenge us to a deeper place in you, Father God. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I, I can remember not too long ago, a couple months ago, um, I, my husband and I went to Newport Beach to spend the day with my parents. And it was on that day that she began to, she just came out of prayer. And, and every single year, my mom goes into prayer and she begins to ask the Lord, what is the theme? What, what, God, what are you trying to do within the Women of Victory Outreach? And she begins to go into fasting and prayer for a theme for all of us for the year. And I remember that day the Lord had given her the word relent relentless. And she goes, Georgina, and she was talking to me and my husband. I, I, the theme, I was thinking about relentless. You know, and, and I had the privilege to brainstorm with her that day. She goes, but I don't want it just to be relentless. Can we find another word on that? <laughs> <laughs> and we were actually in the car, and we were going back and forth, talking about different words. What about relentless this? What about this that? And then finally, um, I don't know who said, what about relentless pursuit? And she's like, yes, that's it, relentless pursuit. And, and there it was, the birthing of the theme that God has given 
our ministry this year. And I don't know about you, but every single year when we have a theme for our ministry, I really, I take that to heart. And I take it as direction from the Lord. I take it as, God, what are you trying to do in me? How does this word, what does it mean in my life personally? And so I began, I've been thinking, I've been meditating, I've been thinking about this word relentless. What does it mean to be a relentless woman? And, and I can't help but think that it means not to relent. What does it mean to relent? To give up, right? To shrink back, to pull back, to give up, to throw in the towel. And to be relentless is the opposite of that. It is to be somebody who doesn't quit no matter how hard Life gets that you have decided to serve Jesus, that you have decided to serve the Lord, that no matter how tough it gets, no matter how much the enemy comes against you, you have decided, you have made a decision to serve God, no matter what. And the other day I was on a hike with Pastor Chris and Brother Stokey, my new BFFs. <laughs> And um, I can remember where I, we went to, how many of you have been to Cal's Mountain Hike? Yes. And it's not easy, right? Those of you, well, don't talk. Those of you in shape, just be quiet right now. <laughs> it's not easy, right? Come on, Slim Thicks, back me up. It's not easy. It's not. For us, it wasn't. And I'm thinking it's just me and Pastor Chris and Brother Stokey. And I think they tricked me because when I got there, our trainer's there to meet us. That just took all the fun out of it for me. <laughs> and, um, and so here we go on the hike. And the whole hike, the trainer is walking behind us. And so I literally felt pressure. Like, okay, I can't have a break. I can't slow down. <laughs> I have to walk a certain pace. <laughs> It, it just created a whole lot of pressure for this hike to have our trainer trailing us. And as we're on the hike, I remember it began getting difficult. There were moments on this hike where I felt like giving up. In fact, right when we started, we were like literally 10 minutes into the hike, and I was tired already. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I was already tired. And I said, oh, my goodness, I'm already tired. I got this trainer following me. What am I going to do? <laughs> and we're walking, and, and it's getting harder and harder as we go up. And here I am, and I'm sweating. And remember, I'm already tired 10 minutes in. And we're going. And I remember something kicked in. Something kicked in. In, in my life, because I have, I have been walking for five months. I have been working out, not every other day, not when I feel like it. Every single day I work out. And I said, God, I've been working out every day. Surely I could finish this hike. <laughs> Why am I tired 10 minutes in? But let me tell you what happened as we're going, and I, and, and I had a choice. Am I going to give up? And I'm, Am I going to be the weak one, the weak link? to say, can we have a little break, please? A little water break, just a little, little water break. <laughs> and we're going, and I'm trying to, you know, keep up, and, and I'm huffing and puffing. Or, but literally, you know, about halfway in, I felt something kick in me that, that said, you know what? You've been training for this, you know, and, and something just shifted in my spirit, and I just felt my body adjust. It was almost like my body said, okay, we're working out. This is what we're doing. Let me make a little few little adjustments. Oh, let me, let me give you a second win here, and something kicked in, and they go, are you okay? I go, I'm great. <laughs> I'm great. I got this. We got this. Let's do this. And we kept hiking up. And 
You know, I made it to the top with no stops. Not one little stop. We didn't stop one time. But it took a relentless spirit. A spirit that said, I'm tired. This hike is getting tough. I feel like I need a little water break. I feel weary. I feel like I'm not in shape for this. I could have thought of a million reasons why I should walk down the mountain and relent and give up. And God began to speak to me on that mountain. This is the kind of spirit that the women of Victory Outreach need. The spirit that says, no matter how hard it gets, I'm not going to shrink back. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to relent. Oh, but I'm going to gird up the strength that the Lord has given me and let it rise up inside of me to take me to the top of the mountain. And so we need a relentless spirit if we're going to be a woman that God can use. And too many times, every time trouble strikes, what do we want to do? We want to give up. We, and then sometimes we even say, can I just have a little break? Can I just please have my little water break? I'm burnt out. I'm tired of serving. I'm tired of going to church. I'm tired of the fight. I'm tired. I just need a break. And you know that many women never left their little break. They, they camped out where they were only supposed to take a break and never came back. But just like my trainer was trailing me. I want to tell you, women, God is trailing you. And God is trailing you. God is leading you. God is surrounding you. And every day of my life, I tell God, I say, God, I need you to lead me today. I need you to trail me today. I need you to surround me today. I need you, God, because that's the kind of life I live. I, can, I don't live a life where I could do without God. I don't live the kind of life. If you're living a life where you could do it without God, you're not living God's purpose. You're not living out God's plan for your life because God's plan will always be a God-sized plan. God's plan will always drive you to your knees every time. It will all, because it's, you know why? It's bigger than you. His plan is always bigger than us. His plan is always so big and great that you're like, oh, my God. It, it just drives you to your knees in the morning. God, I need you. I can't do this in my own strength. I can't do this in my own power. I need your anointing in my life. I need your power working in and through my life. Relentless woman is a woman who doesn't give up, never relents, no matter how hard it gets. She's a woman that knows how to go to God. When things get tough, she knows how to go to God. And, and I want to go over three areas, three, three areas, three qualities of a relentless woman. And the first one is a relentless love. A relentless love. And, and one of my favorite stories in the Bible is found in Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And, and you'll find the story in that passage of the stretcher bearers. How many of you have heard that story? And I love that story because to me it's a picture of God's love. And you know that God's love is it needs to be flowing in and through our life. I want to tell you a few things about God's love. God's love is revealed to us through who? Through Jesus Christ. That cross, when he gave his son to die for every one of us, that was God's love. The love, his love is steadfast and unchanging. His love comforts, his love compels others. And we, every single one of us, are extensions of God's love to a hurting world. 
every single one of us, for many of us, we're the only Jesus that our loved ones are going to see, that our coworkers will ever see, that our neighbors will ever see. God's love, his relentless love for us needs to be flowing in and through our lives. And in Mark chapter 2, we find the story of the stretcher bearers. And what was so beautiful about this story is you have four friends that find this paralyzed man. And they begin to hear about Jesus. And they begin to hear that there was this Jesus that was out performing miracles. And they begin to hear that paralytics are getting healed. And they begin to hear that the blind can see. And they begin to hear about all the miracles that are taking place. And here they find this paralyzed man. And, and, and you know, the, it was an ordinary day for them. They were just going about their normal day. How many of you have gone about your normal day and you stopped? for somebody in need. And this is what they did here. They were going about their normal day, but then they began to come across a man who needed a miracle. And what they did is they stopped and they, they partnered up, the four of them, and they said, we're going to take this man to Jesus. And then they began to hear that the house was packed out that there was no room, that in fact it was so packed that people were outside of the house trying to get in because there were so many people desperate and hurting and in need of Jesus, in need of a miracle. But you know what? These men were relentless. That didn't stop them. How many of us would have stopped there? Oh, it's packed. Oh, there's no parking. Oh, we'll just try another day. These men were relentless. They said, it's packed. There's people coming out of the house, and, and we can't get in. So let's find another way. And what did these relentless men do? I wish they were women. <laughs> but it's OK. They were men, relentless men, but I'm picturing some relentless woman that would have done the same. And you know what these relentless men did? They said, let's go on the roof. Okay, we can't get in from the back. We can't get in from the front. It's packed here. It's packed there. Our only option is to climb upon the roof, and then I could just picture them talking to each other. I picture them looking and talking, okay, we're on the roof. Now what? How do we get in now? And then I picture them say, okay, well, let's dig a hole. <laughs> this is radical. And you know that these men began to dig a hole in the roof. Can you picture being in here and all of a sudden somebody comes down from the roof in a stretcher? It's crazy. But these men were desperate. And I believe it was the love of Christ inside of them. I believe, oh, that that was a supernatural kind of love that made them climb upon that roof and that made them dig through that roof. And, you know, that back in those days, they had to dig. It was earth. It was compacted. It was not easy to dig through it. But they, I, I picture it took them hours to dig a big enough hole to fit this man in his stretcher to let him down. That's a big hole. That would take a mighty long time. But they did not relent. They did not give up. And there comes down this man in the stretcher. And they took a risk, too, because they took the risk of Jesus getting upset, right? What are you guys doing? You're messing up these people's house. <laughs> they took a risk. Ladies, sometimes we need to take a risk. We need some risk takers to rise up in this place. <laughs> Women that say, I want to make an impact, and I'm willing to take a risk on somebody. And here, lo and behold, this 
stretcher begins to come down. And Jesus looks, and I believe Jesus was like, whoa. And you know what caught the attention of Jesus more than anything? What caught his attention was their faith. He said, because of your faith, because of your faith, I'm going to say that again, because of your faith, he is going to be healed. And you know that it was because of their faith, because they could have gave up and they could have relented. And I think about all the times you and I and many of us have relented and given up on people, given up on souls. But I pray that this is a new day. I pray that this is a new year that we say, oh, we're going to be relentless in our love for people. We are going to be an extension of God's love to a hurting world. We're the church. We are the church. And so we don't have the luxury just to live this casual Christianity. If you're living a casual Christianity life, you need to stop it. Because that's not the Christian that God intended for you to be. You're being religious. You're practicing religion. But the church that I read about in the word of God is a church, is a women that are relentless, that will go out there and touch the lives of hurting people and bring them to the cross. Whatever it takes. If it takes you a little bit of gas, you'll do it. If it takes you out of your little way, if it disrupts your day, your perfect little day, you'll do it because you love people and because you realize you are an extension of God's love to a hurting world. And that leads me to my second quality, and, it, and the second one is a relentless faith. A relentless faith. And I can't help think about our ministry and how our ministry was founded on a spirit of faith. You know, you think about our story dating all the way back to the pancake miracle. And I, th I know that story well because I played my mom and we did a treasures program, and I had to play her. And because I'm such a bad actress, we had to do like 50 takes. <laughs> this is true story. <laughs> I'm a bad actress. That's very true. And, and because of it, I, they had to keep going, okay, take 25, take 26. <laughs> and so I had to, there I go, I say the prayer again. And, um, and the prayer just impacted my life because it's a powerful prayer. How many of you have read Treasures? It's a powerful prayer. She's in the projects. This is the, the, the beginnings of our beautiful ministry. You know that our ministry is a miracle? Nothing short of a miracle of God. And I think about the beginnings. She's living in the projects. And I wasn't born yet. My oldest sisters were born, Debbie and Doreen. And they were poor. Okay, you, th you know, you think of the poorest person you know. They were poorer than that. Okay, they were living in the projects in, in East L.A. And um, there were shootings every night. There was roaches everywhere. Um, they were so, so poor, it was po. <laughs> Pastor Sonny, many people have stories of him that he would be praying and they could see holes on the bottom of his shoes. True story. And here is my dad in this story bringing home all these men. He brought home about seven men that needed Jesus. 
And he's in the living room of that project apartment with roaches and, and poor and telling them how great of a God he serves. Telling them how good God is. How big God is. And then he asks my mom, can you make them breakfast, Julie? And, and she goes into the kitchen knowing she has no food. And she remember, you know the story, she finds a little bit of pancake mix. Just a little bit. And she says, oh, my God, Lord, how can I go back out there and tell, the, tell my husband in front of these men that we have no food when he's out there telling them how big of a God you are? And she said, Lord, you need to give me a miracle here. And imagine if she didn't even bother using the mix. I mean, how many of us would have went out there and said, babe, how, uh, there's no food? <laughs> and then later you would be like, how do you bring these men home? You know you don't got food. And <laughs> A spirit of faith. The kind of spirit of faith that caused her to get that little bit of pancake mix and pour it in a bowl and begin to seek God, begin to pray, oh God. And she said she didn't open her eyes and she just kept her eyes closed as she prayed, God, my husband's out there telling these men that need you how big of a God you are. I can't go out there and tell him that we don't have food. Oh, I can't do it. She kept praying and stirring and praying and stirring and when she opened her eyes she said the bowl was filled so full that she had to grab more bowls to fill the other bowls it was a miracle the pancake miracle and that's the that's the beginnings of this ministry that's the spirit of faith that this ministry was founded upon. Not the kind of faith that says, oh, we don't have no food and, and crabbing and nagging. No. We come from a line of relentless women with relentless faith. It takes a relentless woman to believe God that he's going to multiply that pancake mix and he's going to provide. And she was out there. And you know it was dinner time? It wasn't even breakfast time. <laughs> and she tells it even funnier in private, and I'll, I'll tell you guys too. And it was dinner time. So she goes out, and she just has a beaming smile. And she just is so overjoyed how God provided that day. And, she, and it was more than the pancakes for her. It was God saying, my approval is upon you. My approval is upon this ministry. And there she goes out with the piles of pancakes. And then she says, my dad said, pancakes for dinner? <laughs> and she said, I just wanted that. I almost lost it at that point. <laughs> But that's the beautiful legacy of faith that we come from, Victory Outreach. Faith, a, a ministry that was founded upon great faith. And I think about the word of God, and I think about all of the, the legacy of faith, and I have it in my notes. I, I don't have to go over it, but you know that without faith, it's a, it is impossible to please God. You know story after story after story, examples of faith exercised in the word of God. God is not pleased unless we have a spirit of faith. You know what the opposite of faith is? The opposite of faith is doubt. Yeah, fear too. But you know that our, our flesh is immediately going to doubt right away. But you know what? That's not God. That's not God's way. God wants us to have a spirit of faith. 
And, and so many times we're okay and too comfortable in that state of doubt, in that state of not trusting, in that state of fear. And God's sitting back, I believe, and saying, if you would only put your trust in me, if you would only believe what my word says, if you would only exercise a little bit of faith in your walk with me. And I think about the story of Peter. Don't you love the story of Peter? When they were in the boat, and what happened? A storm came, right? And when the storm came, th they were all in fear. And then Peter sees somebody walking on water. And then when he sees somebody walking on water, I love Peter. He's one of my favorite disciples because he, again, is relentless. And what does he do? He gets out of the boat. I mean, picture a storm, okay? This is a storm. Have you ever been in a storm? I have. In fact, we thought we had a storm in San Diego. That's nothing. But to us, it was crazy, right? They were in a storm, and there's Jesus walking on water. And Peter gets out of the boat, and he begins to walk on water. He's walk, And as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was walking on water. But the moment he took his eyes off Jesus and he began to look at the storm around him, what happened? He began to sink. And women, that's us many times. We take our eyes off Jesus and we begin to look at our circumstances. We take our eyes, Jesus is saying, go, do big things for me. And you're looking at your circumstances. Oh, but this, God, but that, but this and that. Taking your eyes off of him. Because when you keep your eyes on Jesus, you're going to do big things for him. He's going to lead you to higher ground. But we, many of us, are guilty of being like Peter many, many times and, and taking our eyes off Jesus. And we, we begin to look at the storm. And the moment we look at the storm around us, we begin to sink. And you know what kind of woman we need? I, I believe that Jesus wants to see a woman that have big faith. And I believe it pleases him, just like it pleased him when he saw the stretcher bearers. And, and, and he said, whoa, look at the faith of these men. It pleased him. I believe that when he sees women of faith, women that are out there saying, I'm not going to put limits on God. You know, we took pledges the other day in our church, and, and you know, I just have to say, we started off high. We started off at $10,000 pledges. And there are many people in our church that stood up for a $10,000 pledge. You know why? Because that's where their faith is at. Then we had others that stood up for $7,500 pledges and $5,000 pledges and $2,500 pledges. But you know what? There was one single mom from the hood. And when she stood up, I even said, oh, my God. She stood up for a $10,000 pledge. And I'm not trying to embarrass her. But I believe that that was a relentless kind of faith. That was relentless. That she said, I'm not putting no limits on God. If there's a $10,000 pledge, oh, then that's the pledge that I'm going to make because I A God that can move mountains, that could do all things. And she's experienced many blessings. In fact, she came up to me again and she said, God, I got another promotion. I don't know what to do. I keep getting blessed. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and clap because she's caught it. She's caught it. You know, you meet God and you, you step out. 
like Peter did. He, st- he, he stepped out of the boat. No other disciples did that. Just he did. When you step out of the boat, trust me, God will meet you there every single time. But so many of us, we'd rather stay in the boat all safe and cuddly, bored because nothing new is happening, because it is so exciting to live a life of faith. It is truly exciting. It's like you find money. I mean, crazy things happen. You get checks in the mail out of nowhere. You get promotions you didn't expect. It is exciting to live a life of faith. But when you don't, trust me, it's boring. Ain't nothing new happening. And God, I believe he's saying, if you would only Trust me, if you would only be a woman of faith. And I, and I want to see, it, I want to see, you know, I, I, this need, anybody who's holding back from God, that needs to stop. You need to stop it already because you know that you could hold back for, for, one, for one year, not just finances. Finances is a big deal because the Bible says that that is where our heart is with our pocketbook. So it is a big deal, but also with your time and your talent and believing God for your unsaved loved ones and having faith in all things. Some of us, our lack of faith has held us back too long. And and God's saying, today is the day you need to step out of that boat. You've been in that boat way too long. It's time to step out of that boat and watch me move in your life. How many of you say, it's my time. It's my time. You know, in my life, I've never lived a safe, normal life. I don't know what that is. You know, I I wouldn't want to live a normal, safe life. The only life I know how to live is a life of faith for God. And watching him open one door and another door and another door, And to me, when I read my word, that's the kind of life I see lived out in the word of God. And the women, I love the women who walked with Jesus. How many of you have ever studied the women who he hung out with? They were powerful women. He didn't hang out with no slackers. He didn't. He didn't hang out with lazy women with no faith. Heck no. The Bible says what kind of women they were. They were women, it says there, that they supported Jesus out of their own means. That means that they supported him financially. They wanted to see him go from town to town. They wanted to see the gospel spread. They wanted to see souls saved. They wanted to see people healed. And so you know what they did? They they said, Jesus, we got you. We have the finances. Don't worry about it. And the Bible says that they supported him out of their own means. And so many of you, if you're not tithing in your church, you better stop that. You better start tithing. Because you know what? That's just the bare minimum. 10%. 10% is God's. Actually, it's all God's. He lets you keep 90. And he says, just give back the 10. And if you're not a faithful tither, tithing isn't tithing when you feel like it. And tithing isn't the last of it. It's the first fruits. The Bible talks about giving the first 10. So some of you, you pay all your bills, and then you say, can I afford to tithe? And then you tithe off of what's left, and you drop a crumbly old $5 bill in the basket. That, that's, that makes me sad. Because that's how much you value the house of God. And to God, this is his church. This is not anybody else's church, but his church. And for all God's done in your life, you can't even be faithful 
to a little 10%. Now, my mom was telling me a story the other day because I have some friends. We were reminiscing. We went to my brother's birthday party. He turned 50. Oh, my gosh, he's old. He's so old. (laughs) And there was a couple there, old friends of mine, and I was telling my mom, a story. He, I go, you know, remember her? I go, I remember one time us talking, and she was married, and, and she, my dad had preached the message, and he goes, and some of you, you know, you need to go home and make sure whoever's doing the finances in your home that they're tithing, and, and uh, he said, because he found that the couple was married, and the wife did the finances, and the husband didn't know she wasn't tithing. And so he met with the leaders. He said, what is going on? You're a leader. You're not tithing. And, and he said that the husband cried. He said, what? And he looked at his wife. You haven't been paying our tithes? Heavy, right? And so when, he, when that happened, my dad realized there are Everybody has the one person in the home that pays the bills, right? You guys are quiet right now. (laughs) Oh, glory. (laughs) Every household, there's the bill payer. And the other spouse that doesn't pay the bills is probably assuming that the tithe is being paid. And so my dad went up on a Sunday and he said, whoever does the bills in your home, you better make sure they're, that they're tithing. You better check their checkbook. And so my friend, she, she, that Sunday, we were laughing uh, the other day about it. She, go, she came to me after church. Oh, my God. I got to go home. My husband pays the bills, and I got to check our, his checkbook. <laughs> she was terrified. <laughs> she goes, because if he's not paying the tithe, I'm going to be so mad. <laughs> and... And I remember she went home, and she checked it. She checked, and she came back that night. She goes, Georgina, I'm so excited. I'm so relieved. I'm so happy. And she goes, when I checked the checkbook, oh, my goodness, my husband's such a big giver. He ties. He gives offerings. He's one of the biggest givers in the church. She was blessed. You know, women faith. We have to have faith and we have to put our trust in God. And if we really believe the Bible and if we really believe what the word says, we believe it in every area of our life, even in the area of our finances. We have to take our faith to a new level. And the last one, if the worship could make their way up, the keyboard is relentless worship, relentless worship. And I realize that many women, and I could tell when we worship, when it's, when it's time for worship service, that many women don't understand the amount of power there is in our worship. But there is so much power when we begin to raise our hands to Jesus and we begin to worship him in spirit and in truth, not just singing, blah, 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 singing songs, empty. He doesn't like that. If you're going to sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus. I am a worshiper first and foremost. I don't know why I can't sing. I wish I could sing. I tell God, if you gave me a voice, I would have been the best worship leader ever. I really believe. In heaven, I'm going to be a worship leader. <laughs> but there's a story. And um, I'll, I'll uh, let, take notes on that. The story of King Jehoshaphat. And it's really, truly one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And it's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. You can read it later. I really want you to read it later. 
Second Chronicles chapter 20. And we find a story of King Jehoshaphat. And, um, and he got news that there were enemies all around him getting ready to attack and invade Judah. And when he got this news, he was terrified. Terrified. Can you imagine getting that news that three armies are getting ready to surround you and conquer you guys? He was terrified because he knew that there was no hope for them, that they would absolutely lose against three armies. And so what happened was what he called a fast and prayer. And he got all the people of Judah, all the people of Jerusalem. And he said, we have to fast. We have to pray. And, and, and the word of God talks about all the people coming in and all the people uniting as one to fast and to pray and believe God for a miracle. And what happened? God gave him a plan. And guess what the plan was? The plan was worship. The plan was sing songs of worship. Oh, go, go out in a spirit of worship. In fact, they even got worshipers. They got five worshipers and said, you're going to go ahead of the armies. And you're going to go ahead, ahead of us and sing songs of worship. Because there's power in our worship. And women, there are many times in our walk with God, in our calling, that you're going to feel like you are surrounded by the enemy. There are going to be times when you are going to feel under attack. You're going to feel surrounded. And you're going to feel like you're in need of a miracle. But I want you to know tonight the power in your worship. There is power in your worship. And so when you sing, when I sing worship, I'll tell you what's going on in my head. I'm thinking about all my problems, right? And I'm saying, God, as I worship you, I'm kicking the devil out of my life. God, I got money problems, but when I worship, I'm kicking the devil out of my life. Oh, I got, I got an unsaved daughter, but when I worship, I am kicking the devil out of my life. But some of us, we come in, and there's powerful worship taking place. The Spirit of God is here. And you don't even raise your hands. You don't even sing the songs of worship. And I believe God's looking down. And he's saying, you want all these things to take place in your life. And you won't even give me a sacrifice of praise. You won't even give me worship. That's the only part of the service. When we worship him in song, and when we worship him in our tithes and offering, that's the only part of the service where we're giving something to God. The rest of it, you're, we're taking, taking, taking. Getting blessed, getting blessed, getting blessed. But God's saying, hey, what's up with this relationship? What is a relationship? It's a two-way street. Otherwise, it's not a relationship. We give our worship to God, and he gives us back miracles. We give our giving, our tithes unto the Lord, and he gives us back breakthrough and healing. It's a relationship. And I pray we have a women 
that are relentless in their worship, that when it's time to worship, that you're worshiping and that you're understanding when I worship, I'm kicking the devil out of my home. I'm kicking him out of my life. You need a healing in your body? Worship him. You need your husband to get saved? Worship him. You need a miracle in your life? Worship him. And you want God move on your behalf? When the army went into battle, they sent the five worshipers. They were on the front lines. Can you imagine? They were on the front lines. They said, you guys go ahead of us with no armor. Go ahead of us. And you just sing your songs to, the, to God. You just sing those songs of worship. And there they go, ahead of the armies, singing songs of worship. And those of you that don't know the story, read it later because you will see, oh, that the victory was theirs. And I want to tell you, women, that the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. When you worship, you take the battle out of your hands and you give it to God and you let God move in your life and you see miracles take place. You see mountains move. You see, you see the Red Sea parted in your way. Oh, we need a woman who are going to relentlessly worship Jesus. Stand up and worship him right now. Stand up and give him a worship. You raise your hands and you worship him in spirit and in